thank you guys for joining and taking the time to to uh, stick with us this afternoon. This has been uh, quite an exciting way to do this, and and as Don said, we do we 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 do get to do this in person a lot. Uh, when we do it in person, the, the presentation style is actually very different. It's very much sitting down and playing with machines. Obviously, that doesn't work so great in this one. Um, and with a slight apology in advance, the, the deck that Don had said that I was going to talk a lot about governance and compliance in this one sort of shifted that to being around the communication strategy. And this time, we're really going to dig in and talk about uh, identity and identity management and how we can make sure that we're scalable and future ready. So. Um, a little bit again about me. If you weren't here earlier, uh, I'm Synergy's technical employee number one. Uh, this is my eighth year with the company, which is insane in IT terms. Uh, but I've had an absolutely wonderful time doing it. I was actually brought on board because I had already done two years of uh, Microsoft cloud solution support, um, which, you know, kind of is and isn't true at the same time. I was a BPOS adopter early on, but Again, can't do a show of hands here. Does anybody know what the first commercially available cloud service was and when it launched? It was actually Windows Update. So Windows Update has been online pretty much the entire time that my career has been going. And only now in the last 10 or so years have we really started to say cloud adoption, right? But the reality is Windows Update has been out there for over 20 years. And in that 20 years, it has never been taken down by virtue of an attack. So that's pretty awesome. Anyway. If you were with me earlier this morning, you heard my classic castle defense uh, discussion, right? Perimeter controls, limited ingress and egress, all users and devices conveniently protected within the enclave. It's a pretty good metaphor, honestly, uh, for traditional domain structures, even those that preceded Active Directory. And as security uh, requirements grew more complex over time and businesses changed, we started to see additional walls and towers erected in and around our castles. We had user domains and resource domains and daisy chain trust relationships. And then Active Directory came along and brought sites and services, domains and trusts, and new group types, new control mechanisms. And just as the, the castles kind of kept building their armories and parapets to keep up with the changing requirements over time and centuries, it scaled well until, as I said earlier, gunpowder came to Europe, right? Boom, 2007, the world changed on us and Steve Jobs came back and put Apple squarely back on the map. So our identity on solutions on premises continued to evolve, right? We started to get these, these great mapping capabilities out there, but they were not evolving at the pace that the technology adoption was occurring, the cloud development was occurring, even back in those early days, like before 2010. And IT's answer was to ban the iPhone, right? Force everybody to use a BlackBerry because we understood that. It had a server, a server we could rack mount next to the Exchange server. And that felt right and good. But honestly, even way back then, the shiny was starting to wear off, right? Executives were clamoring for change. Um, shop floor people were coming in with iPhones and streaming music off our Wi Fi. It was killing us. And then as we started to, you know, prepare to start to adopt and change to this, our replication topology also started to get a little bit out of control, right? And we have these spaghetti disasters all over the place. And yeah, sure, AD scaled a little bit over time and gave us things like granular password controls and a recycle bin. But you could also run into a whole host of exotic challenges trying to manage AD. So we started to see things like slow replication, having a password reset take hours as it chased a replication cycle all the way around the globe. We would see things like replication islands, which are the most horrifying thing in the world to try to troubleshoot, um, where the, suddenly all of, you have a site that's participating fine in AD and it looks great, but then the CEO travels to that site and all of a sudden she can't log in. And the only back out method ends up being to demote the domain controller, take all the local devices out of the domain and put them back in and say that we did a good job, right? It's challenging. Then we would chase things like a, somebody would add a new domain controller somewhere or add a new subnet somewhere. And all of a sudden, the whole globe is dealing with a slow logon experience. And to this day, 21 years later, I have met less than 10 people in, who can tell me what all of the different types of groups are in Active Directory and what is their purpose. Trust relationships. My dear sweet Lord, we still sit in meetings and argue over what is the trust relationship and which way do you build it to achieve what you're looking for. Most of the time, we would end up punting and say it's got to be two way. Just can't end up, can't, can't work around this anymore. But the real challenges that we get into have to deal with the identity management as a, as a, at a large scale, right? Things like 
admins can still, 21 years later, reset their passwords to their current value. If they can log into ADUC, they can reset it to exactly what it is today. And we actually have very limited password and authentication controls. And it's not going to change. Active Directory has been a fully matured product since Windows Server 2016. You cannot go in and, I mean, you can install a 2019 server, but there's no Active Directory version 2019. That's That just isn't a thing. It's as mature as it's going to be at 2016. So let's talk a second, take a second, and then talk about what passwords really have meant, how they've evolved, how they've been controlled and changed, and, and where Active Directory excels and where it maybe doesn't. So again, it's 21 years old. Happy birthday, uh, Active Directory. You can go get yourself a beer now. We appreciate your time. But really, password controls have only changed very little bit uh, over those 21 years. And most organizations, password policies look pretty much like what we have here. We can enforce complexity and length and all that jazz. But there is literally nothing baked into Active Directory to prevent a password of ABC123 exclamation at hash. There's nothing to stop you from doing a keyboard run. Um, all it cares about is length and whether or not that hash, well, length, complexity, and whether or not the hash exists in the user's uh, history. And the only reason the length recommendations are eight or more in most domains is because NT hash tables are split into seven character chunks. So the thought was that if an attacker could get access to your local hash table, they could download it, they could run an attack against the hash table. If you only had a seven character password, you only had one hash to break. So we all thought, well, we're gonna be exceeding that capability, we're gonna go to an eighth character. But what you end up with is a whole lot of users with a seven letter word and a one, or a two, or a three. And they just increment it every 60 to 90 days. Well, that means that that first seven character chunk the hash value never changes. So if somebody did get access to your hash table, they don't have to re-break that old hash. They only have to worry about the one, the two, the three, the four. So we're not actually driving a tremendous capability of security around our NT hash table. And again, it's not going to get better, right? It's as mature and developed as it's going to get. So even though this picture up here says November 2016, that's current. And the, really, the the concept of password management has changed a lot. So 30 some years ago, the, the dude who published the password Bible wrote out all the rules for how we've managed passwords over the years, right? Um, minimum of eight characters, so we get that second chunk. Enforce complexity with a minimum of three different character types, uh, maximum age of 60 to 90 days. And it really just creates an environment that's very challenging for users and creates the sticky note fiasco. What we've transitioned to, though, is a scenario where complexity is passe and pass phrases are in. Uh, expiration is out. Users should keep passwords until they demonstrate actual signs of, of compromise. Uh, and we can see proof of that with tools that now exist on the internet to help us calculate the relative safety of our passwords. Uh, there was some sound. Did anybody have a question they wanted to ask, or is that just background noise? All right, I'm going to keep rolling. No so, all right, cool. And the dog's barking, so fantastic. I actually sent mine out of the house. Uh, so again, I mentioned that there's there's these websites that exist out there, and, and what they allow us to do is measure the size of our haystack. the The idea is that your password can be collided against, and if somebody eventually tries every combination of characters, they will eventually hit your password. But we can do things to make the password, the haystack bigger, and that effectively makes our password better hidden. Uh, we look at a traditional password here, and again, I'm going to remind you all that my screen's over here, so I'm looking over here and driving over here. Traditional password meeting all the complexity requirements. It has two uppercase, two lowercase, two digits, two symbols. It has a search space depth of 95 different characters that can be involved with it, and it's eight characters long. Active Directory would love this password. AD thinks, man, you got this guy. You are the king of the mountain. But if somebody's got our hash table and massively parallel compute capabilities, they're going to break that password in 72 seconds. By comparison, a passphrase that doesn't have multiple different types of complexity. It literally has just characters and a period at the end of it. Um, and it has a smaller search space, but it actually has 15 orders of magnitude greater search space size. So with that, if somebody is able to download our hash table and just smack the crap out of it locally, it's still going to take them 411 million years to, to, to break that password. The haystack is a little bit bigger. 
But it actually gets worse, right? Because AD, again, is really only caring about can you meet three of those complexity uh, character types? So what we end up with, again, seven letter word and a single digit, we have one uppercase character, six lowercase, one digit. And yeah, the search space size is in terms of orders of magnitude is only off by one, but this can be broken in 2.2 seconds. And online, this user going out into the world is broken in less than an hour. Yep, less than an hour, 37 minutes. All right, I had to look back over and make sure my numbers were right. So we can't even successfully survive to that 60 to 90 day mark if we're doing uh, either one of these traditional Active Directory password management capabilities. So with that said, let's talk a little bit about Azure AD and, and how that's kind of evolved over this time. I mentioned that I've been doing the Microsoft side of this since 2010. And in that time, we migrated to Microsoft's uh, precursor to Office 365, which was BPOS. And very early on in that capability, we got the, in that, in that space, we got the ability to replicate our users over to BPOS. What that enabled was a situation where the users could prim on, sign into on-premises applications and then sign into their cloud environment. But then we got password synchronization, so we actually got true same sign on. Then very quickly after that, we got experimental capabilities of password write back. And cap the capabilities that exist around password management in Azure far outstrip the things that can be done on premises. Azure Active Directory's password filtering looks at things like um, what's trending in the world, what's popular right now. Or I guarantee you coronavirus 19 or COVID-19 is right now on the banned password list in Azure Active Directory. So Azure AD is looking at all these uh, text filters. Um, you can look at things like your company name. It can look at all the winning going to be any again and, and automatically add those character sets and those values to being on the banned list. But it's also looking at passwords that have been seen in the wild and saying, hey, you can't reset your value, your password to password one, right? Because that's a known compromise scenario. But then around that same time, way back in the days, right, we got the ability to not just take our, our uh, replicated identity to Office 365, but we got the ability to extend that through SSO out into thousands of other connected SaaS applications. So now, instead of building the big ADFS environment in our on-premises, we just let Azure take care of it. And literally, the difference is whether or not I'm standing up six servers on-premises to do a CA, to do an ADFS environment, to do an ADFS web proxy, load balancing all of that, putting it all over different places in the world, or just let Azure do it. It's fine. There is no infrastructure to deploy. Just offload that to Azure. But then somewhere around uh, 2014 or 2015, we started to get the ability to also add MFA capabilities. And that's when things started to fundamentally shift for us, right? So again, one of the most fundamental security capabilities in Azure AD and just about any identity management system now is multi-factor authentication. Uh, in numerous studies of attack patterns, root cause analyses, state of security in the world, it's been demonstrated that simply protecting accounts with MFA will block 99.9% .9 of attacks. And there are some people who are willing to put their career on it a fourth nine. And that is crazy. There is literally nothing else to have such a profound impact on your identity security posture as simply enabling MFA. And Azure MFA's capabilities have grown tremendously over time, right? What started off with just being able to do a call to a phone or a text message has grown into rolling codes, an authenticator app, and we're even starting to see some next generation stuff beyond that that I'll get to in just a second. So at the same time that was happening on the Azure side, Windows 10 came out, right? And then Windows 10 had the ability to do uh, MFA at the local device, offering biometric security controls or pin protections around uh, the, the actual unlocking the credentials that existed on the machine to be replayed. And we even got controls that are largely overlooked in a lot of places to make sure that when the user walks away, the device locks, because not everybody had smart cards, right? But we're all pretty good about making sure we take our phones with us when we walk away from the desk. And then we got the ability to integrate the Windows Hello experience back into authentications to web resources. 
So if I go out to uh, a website that is part of my Office 365 or even my Microsoft 365 space at all, it's going to ask me to pick an account, something that's already connected to Windows. Or if I'm at a new device, it's going to say, hey, sign in. And if I want to sign in, it's going to allow me to select uh, um, uh, Windows Hello capabilities and play that into the website to actually grant me access and get me into my resources. And I can take that same protected authentication experience and federate it again now out to thousands of other third party SaaS applications, again with no infrastructure, literally none, not a scrap of it. And then also around that same time frame, so Windows 10 is changing the game, Azure Active Directory is changing the game. We got MFA server, and now we're able to take cloud protections and redirect them back at our on-premises infrastructure. And yeah, okay, maybe Azure MFA server wasn't the greatest solution, and it was replaced fairly quickly with a native network policy server extension. But with more and more productivity and security workloads now living in the cloud, the timing led to the first tentative, do I still need Active Directory questions? And I can tell you that absolutely over the last four years, we have done a number of full infrastructure removals. And we're seeing more and more IT and CIO, uh, IT directors and CIOs start wondering what they're going to do with all that reclaimed data center space. And yes, we have seen disco balls go into that space. Um, it's been an exciting change to watch happen. But yeah, OK, absolutely Active Directory. It's, it's a mature product. It's not going to change. It still has a very functional and very viable role for a lot of organizations, just about any size. Uh, but we don't have one at Synergy. We have never had one. We are 100% Azure, and we have always been 100% Azure. So now with Azure AD, right, we started to actually move, as I mentioned, into a world beyond passwords. And we now have the ability to support uh, passwordless authentication and FIDO2, which is enabling me to do everything from Windows Hello to YubiKeys to wearables. And uh, I keep saving up because I want the ring. I really want the ring that you tap on the machine and that allows you to log in. That is like, whoo, I get excited just thinking about that being the, the, the top of the pyramid for this little old nerd. Um, so blocking, though, at the front door is more than just changing authentication methods, right? It's about intelligent automated incident handling. It's building zero trust and extending that posture to all the systems that we're trying to protect. It's knowing the difference between a risky user and a risky sign-in and applying the right rules for each so that our users can operate securely and with minimal interruption and the bad guys stay out. So as, as Michael mentioned, as, as David mentioned this earlier, the, the, the goal is not security versus productivity. The goal is secure productivity, right? And I don't list this on AD's weaknesses above or the challenges that we face it, uh, face in general, but how many of us have seen, and you can raise your hand silently, no judgment, or written a script that runs on a server about every five minutes that unlocks a user's account, right? Somewhere, sometime, back in the history of your environment, a user's credentials got associated with a service or a process or a scheduled task or whatever, and then they changed their password. But that password change didn't happen on the device that was still trying to authenticate as them. And then you get in law involved in this years long tug of war where the account gets locked out every five minutes. And if there's 10, 15, 20, 30 domain controllers in the environment, how much time are you as the admin going to spend tearing through net log on dot log files to figure out where it's coming from before you just eventually give up in frustration and write the script that just keeps Janet from being locked out all the time? I've seen it over and over and over again. So we can't do that in the cloud, right? Uh, but the problem doesn't go away here. We have scenarios where uh, users, you know, our, our typical account lockout policy is after 10 passwords or five passwords on-prem, the account's going to get locked out. Well, people are hammering on these accounts all day long. They're trying to get in as you know, password spray attacks. We have to make sure that our users are secure and productive too. And we cannot, in the cloud, just write a script that unlocks the user's account every five minutes. That's, that's going to be a career limiting move for us. Um, we need to make sure then that the system is able to know the difference between Janet just trying to do her job and someone hammering away at her password. Or in fact, if she just has a really, really terrible password. So part of that is behavioral analytics, which is what underpins most of the advanced security workloads that exist in the Microsoft 365 stack. So 
I have my demo environment. It's been referred to a couple times already today. Uh, Michael's got some screenshots from it, but I spend a lot of time testing new workloads in there. I go out and I read a new article about something that's come out, and I'm like, oh, cool. I'm going to go play with this guy right now. I regularly sit in our Richmond office when it's open uh, and rebuild our, my devices. Like a couple of weeks, every couple of weeks, I go in and I rebuild them to try something new, a new deployment methodology or whatever. Uh, but most of my authentication traffic comes from that specific IP address, right? Well, last week I went to New Jersey on a business trip and I rebuilt machines in my demo environment for my business trip to New Jersey. And I got some risk signals coming out of that, right? You can see these two authentication attempts from Alan DeYoung and Nestor Wilkie. Alan's happened first and it recognized that there were uh, different patterns involved in my authentication mechanism. I said that I was coming from a new unknown IP address and that was a concern. So automatically the system said, this is probably not you. Uh, if it is you, you can get in as long as you meet an MFA challenge. Well, I did. I was able to meet that MFA challenge. And a few minutes later, I fired up Nestor's machine and got it to the same point. Well, Nestor is also detected as being at risk, but not as higher risk because I was able to meet that MFA challenge as Alan. That data goes back into that six or seven trillion security signals per day Microsoft graph and says this IP address might actually be associated with this environment, still raised him up as a risk, but now only as a low risk. And I've proceeded then to build the rest of my users or devices in this machine. No more risk for any of them, right? That IP address, that location, and the fact that I met the MFA challenge says, okay, this is normal. Contoso has effectively moved to New Jersey, right? So that's noticing the behavioral analytics. But we also need to be able to detect challenges with passwords. And we can actually detect risks of things like password recycling. Uh, or even if the credential pair has been exposed on the internet. And we can take actions to decide if an identity is being detected as being at risk, then we're going to require a password change. But don't worry about that password exchange being, or, or change being exposed to the internet because then that sign-in is now also at risk. So in order to get to the password change, they're going to have to satisfy an MFA requirement to then say, hey, your password's still terrible. You're going to have to reset it. And if you haven't been to haveibeenpwned.com, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's just a great place to go and check to see if your credential pair exists out there in the wild. Uh, I like to check it against my personal account, and I do that for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, my personal account is where I fall back to. It's, it's my keep inside my castle, right? It's where I recover my password resets. It's where my bank account is set to send me uh, MFA challenges, where my Facebook has as a fallback. It's all of my fallbacks come back to this account. If this guy's exposed, I'm in a heap of trouble. And it turns out, yeah, it's been seen in eight separate breaches, including obviously right down here in collection one. If you haven't read about collection one, it's a big one. Uh, and I would strongly advise that you uh, go here, uh, go back to, to have I been pwned, just set up for notifications, check your account, see what's going on. But Azure Active Directory's identity protection is applying those same rules and controls to say, hey, if your information, if your credential pair is in collection one, we're going to make you change your password. So we have all these controls that are now taking the workload off of administrative wor uh, workers, like help desk and, and admins, and applying capabilities that Active Directory simply can't do anyway uh, to make our environment safer and better for us on our behalf. So the key to that, by the way, is self-service password reset. And if you can get to that point, you will drive down your help desk tickets by 30% almost overnight. But I want to stop talking about users for a second. I want to talk about admins, right? So we're usually pretty decent in our environments about understanding. Oh, actually, does anybody have any questions? I'm kind of going through fast, but anybody have any questions? None in the chat window, but great time to pause, Adrian. Yeah. Uh, if, one, if you have questions or comments, please chime in and don't forget to turn on your camera if you feel so inclined. I will assume that you can proceed. All right. I'm, I'm lulling everyone to sleep. Make sure you have plenty of coffee. I've got my fancy Microsoft 365 security and compliance mug here with me to help them fuel me through to the end. Um, so, all right, so we talked about user accounts, right? And protecting user accounts. And that's 
going to be the meat of what we do on a, on a regular day-to-day basis. But we also have a lot of risks in, around admins, and we're usually really good about applying just enough controls to our admins, to our users, whatever. But we also introduce some interesting challenges around our admin accounts. Again, I can't do a show of hands here, but I love doing this one in person. It's my favorite thing in the whole wide world to do. When we tar- start talking about how we build our admin accounts in our environments, I ask the question, is who here in the room has an admin account? Every hand goes up, right? Is it reasonable to predict that your admin account's nomenclature or naming structure is similar to your regular user accounts? And at about 50% of the time, it is. Uh, is it safe to assume that your admin account is active right now? And in most cases, actually almost all cases, it is active right now. Um, do you only ever use your admin account from a privileged access workstation or privileged access network? And I do get a little bit of a bite on this. It happens every once in a while, but it's pretty rare. But the real kicker is, have you ever entered your credentials as an administrator into a Windows 7 machine to help close a ticket? Or have you ever recycled a password between your regular account and your admin account? Now, I watched a couple of people in uh, an event that I did a few months ago turn beet red and hide behind their monitors. It's true. We do it, right? It's a different account. Why would the password be exposed? There's no risk. We're going to be fine. It happens. It really, truly does happen. The other thing, though, that happens in Active Directory, and you cannot get around this, is that once an act, once an account has been marked as an, or added to an administrative role in Active Directory, there is an attribute that flips called is admin. You can't flip it back. There is no provision in Active Directory to unflip the flip. Once it's been flagged as an admin, it's an admin which means that anybody sitting at any compromised machine on your network can simply do an LDAP query or, or uh, PowerShell query against Active Directory for accounts where is admin equals one. And there's your lateral movement right there. It's just there. And again, since 90% of our users that we talk to on a regular basis, the admin accounts are active, the question is, how do you know someone's not using your admin account right now? And in most cases, we get silence. There are very few environments where users have that level of auditing that they can actually get detections on administrative activities happening in real time. So Azure AD, conversely, offers both just enough administrative controls with roles, but we also have just-in-time controls for those roles. And just turning this on, privileged identity management, just turning it on will initiate a full audit of who holds what roles in your Azure AD, whether or not they're actually using those roles, and alert you if anybody gives themselves those roles outside of this space. And I will tell you, going back to my, you know, the last guy left the pager in the middle of the night and left, the first thing I did when I got in there, yeah, I was a bad admin. I created additional backdoor admin accounts as break glass accounts. And it occurred to me as I was doing it, maybe he did too. Maybe I didn't know what accounts were out there. And then in uh, Active Directory back in 2009, there really was no way to know, right? You might have named a bunch of accounts with you know, Bob Jones or set tasks to do all kinds of things like add them to administrative groups, and I would never have known. We now get active alerting when that happens simply by turning this on. So we can control the activation required. So, sorry, let me back up here. We can say that everybody who is a global admin is only a global admin when they need to be. Then we can define rules around activation of that role, how long it will be active before it automatically expires. Uh, We can set notifications around activation, set approvals in case in in, in, uh, our workflows for activation, require that MFA be in as part of the activation process. Um, And then we can actually set, and this is my favorite thing in the whole wide world, We can set system reviews to make sure that that users keep the access they need to do the job they need. And again, if we go back to uh, my my old on-premises environment, I would get the email saying we need to do an audit on who has domain admin rights. So I would get the list of the people and I would call them up and I'd say, do you still need this? And of course, they'd say, I have to have it. I can't do my job without my domain admin rights. Well, Not only am I seeing that you're not actually using them in privilege identity management, but I don't have to make that phone call anymore. I can set up a 
monthly or quarterly semi-annual review that sends an email out to all those role holders. And if they ignore the email, the right goes away. And if they want to lie and say, oh, I can't survive without it, that's their words in response to the email collected at this location, aggregated and delivered back to the auditors. And if you want to lie on record, that's on you, brother. Not my problem. I'm going to let the system be the bad guy. So we get full auditing of all ads, all deletions, activations, whatever the user or the system does. Uh, we can see all that, the time that it happened, uh, uh, follow the activity of what they were doing while they were there. And we can effectively shut down that whole identity traversal through hunting because the neat thing that's happening here is that whole is admin thing doesn't really exist, right? If I begin managing a role with PIM, with Privilege Identity Management, and remove the permanent assignment of the role from the user, they don't appear in a casual query of the role. So if you take, for example, my global admins, everybody in my demo tenant is a global admin because best practices, right? Uh, but most of my users are only eligible to become global admins. So they have the role, just not right now, and they can activate it with a very simple process. But while they're not activated, they will not appear over here in the list of global admins. And we can go a step further too. We can say maybe we've hired a contractor on an ongoing basis, right? We want that person to have an account in our environment on an ongoing basis, but we don't want them to have global admin rights the entire time that they're working with us. Maybe they have a project that needs to be completed by 731. And for that period of that project, they're gonna to need to be able to activate their rights we're going to keep them around past 731, but after that point, they will no longer be an administrator in our environment. So not only can we time bound the capability to activate the role, say for an hour, but we can also time bound the duration of the eligibility for access into that role. And what all of this has allowed us to do is get to a situation where I, as a employee of Synergy Technical, have one account. I don't have two. I don't have an unmonitored admin account. I am me. Me is me. I don't have a situation where I have, or I can go to my Active Directory, my Azure AD, and see that I have a managed account that belongs to me, because that's the other thing we used to do to try to keep track of who owned what accounts. It's just me. And if you query me at any given time, I'm just a regular user, and I can elevate myself when I need to do the thing, and, the, and it goes away. What that means is if I'm only an admin for, say, three hours out of a week, because most of the time I'm in meetings talking about the work, I'm not actually doing the work. If I elevate my account for about three hours of the week, that's a 98% surface reduction or, or a reduction of my attack surface of being an admin. So 99.9% .9 of the attacks we've, sh we've shut down just with MFA, but then we've also further shut down 98% of the attack surface simply by saying, I'm not an admin right now, go hammer on somebody else's account. And all of this then, builds toward a very recent approach to identity governance. And I am over the moon excited about this. Uh, we've covered privilege identity management and how we can use access reviews as part of that privilege management experience. But I wanna talk about entitlement management. One of the biggest challenges uh, to Active Directory, that again, another one that wasn't on my list earlier, was group sprawl. And I'm willing to bet that just about everyone on the call today who has an Active Directory probably has about a 10 to 1 ratio of groups to actual users. Uh, we see it all the time, and we actually get apologies. I mean, one of our little, one of our, our, our niche markets is we actually help a lot with mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and when we start going in to, to look at the environment, the thing an admin does is they apologize for how many groups there are. You, you make the groups, you make, right? No big deal. We're not too worried about it but trying to keep track of the purpose behind those groups and why a solid third of them have no users in them and they're not nested and you don't know if you can remove it because maybe it's tied to a permission from an application from an owner that hasn't lived here for five years. But if you take it away, weird little sprawly things are going to break. And then you overlay the fact that, again, there's probably a fair mix of those as domain local, domain global, maybe even universal groups. And again, there's maybe three people in the whole world who actually understand the purpose behind all those. You get into a really challenging situation of trying to understand how your 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 security really does flow in your environment. Uh, audits of permissions across file structures can take ages, and they get stuck largely in that one section. So with entitlement management, though, we're able to logically group resources 
into catalogs and publish them as access packages. Resources can include groups, teams, SharePoint sites, and even ac external applications, so third-party integrated SaaS applications. And access packages can contain subsets of those resources or even roles within a given external app. So we take a catalog, right? We create a catalog, we assign it to an owner, and that owner then tracks down and claims all the resources in the environment that should be available within it. The catalog owner then builds access packages to deploy to users. And I tend to think of this as roughly aligning to job roles. So in Contoso's tenant, we have a, uh, a job called uh, HR generalist. And there might be 10 or 20 people who have that job title, and they all have the same basic access requirements. So rather than cloning accounts of the one existing HR generalist, we can actually take all the apps, all the accesses, all the resources that the HR generalist might use and serve them up into users in that one role, which we can either do with group-based, self-service, including dynamic group memberships, which basically makes it claims-based access, which is so cool, uh, or direct assignment. So we can just say, I know these people are, these, are in this role, and boom, there they are, giving them the access as they need. Uh, in the case of this HR generalist access package, I've made it visible only to members of the SGHR group, and anyone in that group can do a self-service request to access in that group. Then Diego Siciliani over here has 14 days to process the request, and the assignment automatically expires after 180 days. So if you think about that for tax season, right, maybe we have seasonal workers that come in and they do tax filings for us. We bring them in, we've got a templated account type, we've got uh, an access package, they get in and they do their work, they ask for access. April 16th, that access goes away. There's no management to do, it just does it. So based on the conditions that I laid out before, I added a user in my environment, Earl Bruno, into my HR department and browsed to my access packages, my available access packages, both as him and as the, um, the actual real tenant admin. Uh, and you can see that for him, because he's a member of the right group, HR generalist is available. Uh, he can request it, but it is not available for the administrator to add. So for everything that we've talked about uh, so far, sorry, everything we've talked about has delivered identity app resource controls to our internal users, right? But business doesn't just happen within the four walls. Sometimes we have to deal with others, uh, and like we're all doing today. At its simplest, that can be just sharing email with folks in the outside world, but that brings its own set of risks and challenges. Uh, you might trust a vendor to process a document, but can you legally allow them to have that access on a standing basis? Can you just leave the message in their inbox with the content there? Uh, how can you protect your IP and still allow it to be seen by your external vendors? Right? How do you get reporting on it? How do you expire that access when, when that time is done? And historically, we solved these problems by creating an internal account for the vendor, um, making them sign into our stuff, but really all that did was move the goalposts, right? Because then now we had to trust their devices uh, and we were buying licenses for things that we didn't really need to do. So Teams came along a couple of years ago and said, hey, why don't you just add them as a guest, right? Our first real opportunity came along to open up collaboration with external named users without having to buy them a license. And we can limit their access, govern their communications, set the uh, you know, micro controls. If Steven's still on, he knows that uh, I'm a big proponent of the click in these two buttons because once it's been posted, I don't ever want it unposted. So I've got some governance controls that I can do around guests in my environment without exposing my documents to be taken out of there. Okay, you have to come in here and browse it here. And once a guest is added to a team, they're going to get an email that invites them to join the organization. Uh, they're going to click the link, review permissions, hit accept, and presto, they're going to be in your environment. And along the way, and we did this here too uh, for, our, for our other presenters, on the way in, you have to register for MFA. So once that's done, I, as the admin of this environment, can now see my guest user exactly the same as an internal user. And I went through this process. Uh, let's see if it has the date on it. Um, it doesn't. I went through this a couple days ago sent from my Contoso demo to my actual Synergy account, added myself as a guest in the environment, uh, set up my MFA for access into it. I can see that this account is sourced from an external Azure Active Directory. Uh, I can see that I have actually not only gotten the invitation, but I've actually acted on it too. Uh, I got information here that I can flow back and forth, that I can set up attributes about this user and manage them, assign them roles. I actually assigned my 
guest role as a domain or global admin into this uh, remote tenant. So we can do that. We can set up any number of roles. And then this guest access, which is now a, a global admin in this remote tenant, is managed through PIM, through Privilege Identity Management. So in order to access my global admin role in there, I still have to log in there, then go through an activation process. It's just exactly like as if I were a user in that actual environment. So this works really, really well. We get the users who need access into our stuff to come in, register. Uh, we, have a, we don't have any challenges with non-repudiation. There's no account sharing because the MFA process doesn't scale from one user to another, right? If you're going to register, respond to the MFA, it's going to be on this device. You can't just, you're generally not going to hand the next person this device and say, have fun with my account. But there are times when even this level of access isn't quite enough. Sometimes we just need to ensure that a vendor meets our operational requirements, right? We need the product to be completed on time. And it's really not so much important that we get Adrian Amos to be the engineer. We just need synergy to get in with the right people and solve the problem. We want to be able to audit what they do and know the names of the people that are coming in. But I don't want to pre-screen that. I just, you know, just do what needs to be done and we'll, we'll work these things out later. Um, so we need to be able to manage not just an individual user, but a business partner and the accounts that they bring in for us. So we actually head back to entitlement management again. And this is where we can actually now build B2B relationships with our external organizations. And once we've established those business relationships, those business, external business partnerships, we can build access policies for our access packages. And now Synergy employees, when they come in, can request access to the access packages or the app packages that exist within Contoso's identity governance solutions. And if Synergy can ask for it, and we can build a partnership with an external business, and we can build a partnership with an external guest, we're actually preparing our identity solution for the next big change in identity management. And this is a bold new future, okay? So buckle up, because it's gonna get crazy here for a second. We have all of these great controls built for our internal users, right? We've protected, we've, we've cut out 99% of our attacks. We've cut out 98% of our surface. We've reduced our call volume by 30%. We're now dealing with our external business partners safely and securely. But the future is looking more and more like decentralized identity. And that's a term we've heard very slowly creeping into our lexicon over the last two or three years. It started with GDPR with this whole requirement that a customer have the ability to be forgotten at demand. And it's grown. And it's a mind blower to wrap your head around, or at least it can be. At its core, decentralized identity is self-owned, independent, blockchain and distributed ledger driven identity. But what it enables is actually pretty revolutionary. Humans, actual human beings, own and control their own digital identity. There's no more password resets in this world. They don't exist. That's the user's problem. That's their identity. They bring it with them. Name changes. They get married. They get unmarried. No big deal. It's not getting stuck in your, your IT department for three weeks while trying to figure out who in HR can approve the name change. Updated phone numbers, right? A big ongoing challenge when users buy a new mobile phone or switch carriers. All of those things are now handled by the user, and they're simply plugging it into our systems. All of the administrative day-to-day -day burdens of attribute management are now the user's problem. And if you think about this from a human perspective, it's really quite natural to do it this way. And we're the weird ones in IT who have been telling users to give us their information so that we can update it on their behalf. You, before you were hired, already had a history of digital identity. You had a personal email address, maybe, maybe an Amazon account, Facebook account, whatever. You use those accounts, those identities, to federate and, and control your existence across a wide array of the digital space. And yet, when you sat down for your first day on the job, you began to create a brand new history around an all new digital version of yourself. Why? Your company didn't hire a clone of you to do the work while you went on the rest of your business. They hired you. So why create a clone of your identity to access the work? In a fully realized, decentralized model, your identity, which again, you own, it's not the property of an organization or any government, hosts a personal data store of attributes that you present to external people or organizations or whatever as claims. You start a job, you expose the claims necessary to your employer to satisfy tax and payroll. 
They conversely allow your identity to participate in their cloud instances, open up their access packages to you that way. So you can do your job. When you quit, you just revoke access to the claims. That's it. GDPR's uh, right to be forgotten is solved. You don't exist anymore there. They have a record then only of the things that they authorized. And if the data is fully encrypted, which it is in a decentralized model, right? If the data is fully encrypted and belongs to you and travels with you, then maybe it's safe enough to use for also hosting medical and insurance attributes. And we're actually starting to see this pop up in, in places that are dealing with these compliance challenges. So you're in an automobile accident and first responder needs to know what you're allergic to. And if you're not conscious, they might give you a medication that could kill you. Uh, now we've got you know bracelets and, and med, uh, necklaces and maybe it's on our ID, but if there was something that could be simply queried about you that checks against the database that is exposed through claims to first responders, they can give you life-saving information without you being conscious, get you to the hospital. The hospital could pre, uh, pre uh, go through all their, their intake process without you having to be distracted from the process of having your life saved, right? So there are right now there are dozens, and I mean like many dozens, of decentralized identity providers already out there furiously building frameworks that can plug into existing identity solutions. And Microsoft is one of them. And everything that we have discussed in the identity governance portion of today's presentation is actually built with that future in mind. Everything that we can do right now is built with the plan of supporting user end-to-end -end decentralized identity. And I am so excited about bringing that uh, in, into the space. So crazy thing to think about. Um, it is the future. Be ready for it. That actually does bring me to the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm going to open it up now for any questions you might have. Uh, I appreciate your time today. So Adrian, uh, fairly fairly common question that, that we get. I'll give uh, some of the attendees an opportunity to maybe gather their thoughts. That was a lot of information. I'm sure there's some brains exploding out there. Um, so. And you can't just turn all that on on day one. Uh, what, what, what's the entry point for a customer now that's really looking to secure their identities? So I, I will say that that has changed a little bit over time, right? Um, Generally, the, the first thing to do, the first major focal point is MFA. Absolutely MFA all the way. Um, and that's assuming that you already have identity sourced from where you want it and landing where you want it. So generally, we see you know, large mature organizations, they have an Active Directory, they're sourcing from Active Directory into Azure AD, then they're locking it down with MFA. And we can flow that MFA back to on-prem, out to third-party cloud applications. That is the first step. Um, the caution that I would throw out there, and I, I have slides around it, you don't want to see them, um, are the, the caution is there's a temptation to look at ADFS as being a really strong way to extend on-premises protections to the cloud. Um, I would caution folks to view the cloud as, as being exponentially more mature in its security capabilities than anything ADFS can offer. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and, and as always, great content. I learn something new every time I, I sit through one of your sessions. Any, any of the participants have any questions they'd like to ask? Uh, great opportunity to pick Adrian's brain. It's a scary place, I'll admit, but it, it, <laughs> a lot of spiders in here. <laughs> well, uh, you've got about seven minutes until the next session. I'll give you an opportunity to maybe take a, a quick break uh, before we start uh, the one o'clock sessions. Uh, thank you all for attending and uh, we'll see you in the next session. Thanks everybody.